Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a nice lunch. We're going to resume our uh, conference uh, for the afternoon so that we can finish on time, in particular since we have a video conference at 6 sharp. So I think we should uh, start on time as well. So we're going to reconvene this afternoon. And uh, before we move on to our uh, panel sessions, we, have, we are fortunate to have Mrs. Uh, Mary Kiviniemi, the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, who's going to now deliver her, uh, a keynote speech. Um, Mrs. Kiviniemi uh, took up her duties as OECD Secretary General um, two years ago, I think two years and a half ago, and she is um, um, overseeing the work of my directorate, but also the work on um, governance, which is of course very relevant to what we said uh, this morning, but also the work on trade in agriculture, which to some extent is also when we talked um, this morning, somehow in particular Jeffrey about globalization is something that is very relevant to the work we're doing. Also, I think uh, Gus this morning uh, mentioned the uh, impact of globalization, but uh, Mary was the Finland's prime minister uh, for uh, two years, from 2010 to 2011, and uh, and before that, she was a special advisor to the um, at, on economic policy to the Prime Minister of Finland. So, she came to the OECD with uh, a very good uh, background to help us think through uh, those uh, difficult issues of going beyond GDP and how to improve the well-being of people. So, Mary, please, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, Hello. happy to uh, be here um, and participate in this uh, seminar and uh, also tell about the work we do at the OECD uh, in uh, this uh, area. I think that we all agree that improving people's lives should be the ultimate aim of government policy. The world looks increasingly less stable and predictable today the recent economic crisis has brought real costs to people's quality of life, not just their bank balances, and it has sometimes hurt most those who already had the least. Governments are doing their best to steady the ship, but in doing so, they must steer it towards inclusive growth, one that comes with broad-based benefits to people's well-being. And here, the OECD plays a key role by supporting governments with our data, analysis, evidence, and policy recommendations on well-being. So how can evidence on well-being be used to steer the ship? My hope is that this conference will provide us with some answers. At the OECD, when we talk about well-being, we include a wide range of issues that matter to people, which have been discussed already uh, today. We care about both people's material conditions like income, jobs and housing, but also their quality of life, which includes things like health and education through to personal security and the quality of the environment. Of course, subjective well-being plays a central part in this. We cannot talk about people's quality of life without taking their own feelings about their lives into account. And the life course approach presented at this conference is crucial to the OECD's wider work on well-being because it encompasses so many of the outcomes that matter to people in one overarching framework. Understanding what drives well-being outcomes is essential if we want to design the right policies. For this, we need the high-quality evidence that can inform high-quality public debates, such as the one we are having today. In my remarks, I would like to focus on th three broad themes, some of which very much echo the points raised earlier by Richard, Andrew and Nick, and these are that, firstly, focusing on child well-being is a vital part of well-being research. Secondly, 
measuring adult outcomes is equally crucial. And thirdly, focusing on child and adult well-being makes evident the importance of a life course perspective. I want to begin with some reflections on child well-being. Taking a life course approach means starting early. Of course, child well-being matters as an outcome in and of itself. Children represent a very significant part of the population, but they are often neither seen nor heard in the national statistics that typically shape policy debates. The last edition of our publication, How is Life?, therefore included a special focus on the well-being of children. We showed that even in some of the wealthiest countries of the world, not all children get a good start in life. As you can see here, on average across the OECD, one child in every seven lives in income poverty. And here in the UK, approximately one child in every 10 lives below the poverty line. So better results than that on average in OECD. Across OECD countries, one child in 10 also lives in a jobless household. Since the economic crisis, child poverty rates have risen in two thirds of OECD countries and poverty is more likely to affect households with children than other types of households. Our report also described how children from more affluent families do better than their less wealthy peers across a wide range of outcomes. As you can see here, on average, children from less affluent families report worse health. The gap between the bottom third and the top third of households is larger here in the UK than across OECD countries. And further, children from less well-off families are less likely, likely to find their classmates kind or helpful. Here, again, the gap in the UK is larger than on average across the OECD. These findings matter not just because we care about child well-being here and now, but because they can shape the life ch chances of those children in the future. Inequalities among adults are transmitted to their children and raising child well-being is a critical part of breaking that cycle. Recent evidence suggests that doing so would be good for the economy too. OECD analysis indicates that high levels of inequality can put a break on economic growth by harming the investments that lower income households make in education. As is shown, our research found that, e that uh, when income equality is higher, children from less educated households are also less likely to go to university. To give you a more specific example, a six Gini point increase in inequality, which is the difference roughly between the United States and the United Kingdom, on average cuts the length of time children from the poorest 40% family of families spend in education by around half a year. As well as giving those children themselves fewer opportunities, this reduces the human capital available to help drive productivity growth. So supporting child well-being is an obvious win-win, even from an economic perspective. And I want to be clear, though that isn't this, is, is, this isn't all about education, 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 at least in the traditional sense of focusing on cognitive and intellectual development. As we were told earlier this morning, the most important predictor of adult life satisfaction is not the child's performance in their exams, but their emotional health. And of course, exam performance is a strong predictor of adult income. But there is more to life than money, as these results make clear. We need to get a much better grip on the policies 
that can support children's emotional health and give this the same priority that we give to policies that seek to promote cognitive development. So when we think about child outcomes, we need to think about more than just their performance in school tests. We need to consider children's well-being in the round, including their emotional health. And this is part of what we would do differently if well-being was a key objective for policy. Of course, this is not all about childhood and children. What happens in youth and adulthood also has an impact on well-being later on in life. Indeed, outcomes at every step along the way appear to contribute to, the life, to life satisfaction in middle age. So the idea that your well-being is fixed from a young age and will only ever vary a small amount from this set point simply doesn't hold. Reassuringly, your chances for achieving happiness are not set in stone by the time you leave compulsory education. For example, of particular concern to all policymakers at the moment is the long-term scarring effects of joblessness among young adults. In two-thirds of OECD countries, young people aged 15 to 24 years are more likely to suffer from long-term unemployment than prime-aged workers from age 25 to 54. In 2014, one in every four young Italian workers had been unemployed for a year or more. In Greece, it was one in three. The psychological scars of unemployment last longer than the financial impacts, and we know that they can't be offset through monetary compensation only. Another finding that struck me from the life course work is the role of both adult and parental mental health. Adult mental health is a very important factor in adult life satisfaction. As you can he see here, in many countries, needs for mental health care are often not met. UK research evidence also suggests that there would be large payoffs from, from investing comparatively small amounts of money in better supporting parents to maintain their psychological health throughout the challenges of parenthood. As well as obviously benefiting the quality of life experienced by the parents themselves. And this can simultaneously have a positive impact on the lives and life chances of their children. What I have just said about children and adult well-being clearly demonstrates the importance of the life course approach from a policy perspective. Frederick Douglass, a former slave who became a leader of the abolitionist movement in the United States, once said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. The life course approach puts this truism to the test. Indeed, the experiences people collect over the course of a lifetime influence how they feel about their lives and their circumstances here and now. First, the life course approach helps to tackle the intractable problem of understanding what follows what in complex social phenomena. Does more money make people happy? Or are happier people more likely to make more money? Does having a good education make people happy? Or are happier children the ones getting a good education in the first place? The life course approach can also provide insights into the key windows of opportunity when policy can have the largest impact. Since public money is scarce as it is everywhere, we simply cannot pursue every worthy project that might stand a chance of raising people's well-being. We need a mechanism for helping to choose which levers to pull to have the greatest impact. Yet maximizing a bang for buck 
isn't just about what you do, it is also about when you do it. The birth cohort studies that you have heard about this morning and will hear much more about tomorrow have been a vital resource to address these issues. So too are the policy evaluation studies that consider well-being outcomes alongside other policy outcomes. I want to stress here to the value of looking at this from an international perspective. I'm delighted to see that this will be the focus of the work that will be presented uh, tomorrow. We need to replicate findings across a variety of settings to understand whether we are uncovering general truths about how well-being works or whether what we have found is specific to a given place, a given time and a given cohort of people. The international dimension also offers us the hope of beginning to see how different policy environments can shape responses to different life events and circumstances. And this is of special interest to the OECD. At the OECD, we are pleased to be working closely with Professor Layard and a consortium of international researchers to explore well-being over the life course. This is, a, this is contributing in no in, in significant way uh, to our initiative of uh, new approaches uh, to economic challenges. And as you know, the OECD is no stranger to working on well-being. Since 2011, we have been producing our How is Life publication every second year, describing key findings on well-being across OECD countries. So uh, the next edition will be published then uh, next year. And we have also been working with uh, statisticians and other experts to improve the quality, availability, and comparability of well-being data. This has included writing our guidelines on measuring subjective well-being, uh, which were released in 2013, as well as several other methodological pieces on topics ranging from trust to the quality of the work environment to the joint distribution of income, consumption, and wealth. And we are also committed to collecting better information about child well-being. In our 2015 PISA data collection launched here in London last week, we included questions about well-being. And a special volume will be released detailing those results next year. And we also have a new project in on our education department on child, social, and emotional skills and how these affect well-being outcomes in adulthood. We plan to launch an international study on this next year, examining the experiences on several different country, cities around the world. And despite the importance of uh, child well-being for lifelong outcomes, in most OECD countries, social spending that is devoted to children is lower than that for the retired population. At the same time, many countries don't have a child-centered policy addressing children's diverse needs from the earliest years of life. And when it comes to economic policymaking, we are developing tools for assessing whether the growth-promoting options the governments, uh, that governments have at their disposal will contribute to inclusive forms of growth growth that benefits the well-being of people. But if we want to track changes in well-being over time and try to understand the societal level drivers of change, we need to have a way of regularly monitoring countries' well-being too. The UK Office for National Statistics has been a trailblazer in this respect, along with countries such as Canada, France, Italy, Netherlands, and more. In fact, as you can see here, the large majority of OECD statistical offices have collected at least some information about people's life satisfaction in recent years. And this work must continue so that we can build up 
a sufficient evidence for analysis of well-being over time. But actions speak louder than words. And this is why the OECD is more than ever committed to put well-being front and center in its data collections, its analysis, and its policy advice, and to support initiatives such as today's conference. Because improving lives is, after all, what policymaking should be all about. Thank you for your attention.